Hello, everyone. You know, still a few minutes early. Thank you very much for coming early. As you know from our last lesson, I greatly appreciate it. Ah, hello, Catherine. Thank you very much for joining us from Sudan. Catherine, I was in um, Omdurman and Khartoum about, must be about five or six years ago. Are you, are you from Khartoum? Ah, uh, Apple Zheng, thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, Apple Zheng. Well, as you probably know, I was meant to be running training in Malaysia this week, but obviously I had to cancel that because of the situation. I'm hoping to visit Kuala Lumpur sometime this year. Oh, you're from South Sudan, Catherine. Ah, very nice. Ah, oh, Vincent, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you from Pakistan. Thank you for ThinkPad. It's very nice we've got such an international crowd from Malaysia across Pakistan, down into Sub-Saharan Africa, across Europe. Very pleasing. So let's begin. First of all, thank you everyone for joining the lesson today. I hope you're going to enjoy it. I hope you've been enjoying the course so far. What we're going to look at in this lesson today, I'm going to deal with some aspects of contract law relating to the common law system. And then we're going to look at some grammar. Right, let me now share my screen. So, the first thing we're going to look at comes from our contract law course. We have a nice course on contract law. It's about 40 lessons long, however. I can't include all 15 or 16 hours of it in this course but I'm going to deal with one of the most essential topics relating to common law contract law. Let's expand the screen. And what we're going to uh, look at is the five essential requirements of a common law contract. I'm going to go through this as quick as possible because it's a lecture and lectures tend not to be particularly exciting. So the five requirements of a common law contract. Right, well, you know, signing a contract is serious for anyone because, of course, they carry obligations. Binding contracts are contracts which can be enforced through the courts. In the common law, not all contracts have to be in writing. The common law derives from the period when most of the population of England and Wales and Scotland did not know how to read or write. And so the law is based upon their ordinary behavior. This is why the word reasonable is so important in the common law. Because if we consider that a person's behavior was reasonable, then we'll allow it. They're not committing a crime. They're not breaching the contract. If, on the other hand, their behavior is not reasonable, as viewed by an ordinary member of the public, then they will be in trouble. So contracts weren't in writing a thousand years ago. And in fact, many contracts today still aren't in writing. If you get on the bus to travel to work, you don't expect a written contract from the driver to take you to work. You merely pay money and you're transported without any written contract being provided. Most sorts of contracts in the common law do not have to be in writing other than contracts for the sale of land or interests in land insurance contracts pre-nuptial agreements and a number of seven other rather strange sorts of situations which you very rarely come across for example uh, where a lawyer lends his client money to avoid the client having to sell off land which the client has inherited. Now, I don't ever come across a lawyer lending a client money anyway, let alone to avoid the client having to sell land. So what is a contract? A contract is an agreement entered into voluntarily. It must be voluntarily by two parties with the intention of creating a legal obligation. What is a legal obligation? Well, it's an obligation that can be enforced by the courts. Now, contracts can be in writing, they can be purely verbal, 
They can be a mixture of verbal and in writing, or they could be purely from your behavior. So Romans thought it was very bad if people entered into contracts and then broke those contracts. They gave us the phrase pacta sunt servanda, meaning a bargain must be kept. In ancient Rome, if you entered into a contract and broke it, you receive a public penalty, a sanction from the state, which gave rise to the system of providing damages for breach of a contract. It became normal for people to have to pay when they broke contracts. Now, there are five essential requirements of a contract. First, there must be an offer. This can be to one person or to the world at large. Second, that offer has to be accepted. There are rules as to acceptance. Who can accept? Usually only the person the offer is made to, unless it's made to the world at large, like a newspaper advert. And then third, consideration. This is a legalese word. It means something of commercial value that is passed between the parties under the contract. One US dollar, one pound, one real, one dirham, one ruble, they all have a commercial value. So they can be consideration. But so does the valuable work which you give your employers each month. That's your consideration under your contract of employment. And in return, your employer will give you a salary. Consideration has to have a commercial value. I can't, for example, offer to uh, tell you six jokes in return for five US dollars, because six jokes have no commercial value. Consideration doesn't have to be equal to the value of the thing that it buys. We all go into shops looking for a bargain, hoping to find something that is cheap, but worth far more than we're paying. <clears throat> They're very valid contracts, even though we pay less than the thing is worth. And capacity relates to both legal and mental capacity of the parties to contract. Any company which is properly formed, any organization which is properly formed, like a charity or a government or a religious body, and any human being over the age of consent, an adult, usually can enter into a contract, but there are restrictions on some human beings. You can't enter into a contract if you're a child, nor if you're a mental patient at a mental hospital, nor if you're a serving prisoner in prison. There are limits on the ability of a person who is presently bankrupt to enter into a contract. They can only make contracts for what are called the essentials of life. The essential things you need, food, clothing, accommodation. They couldn't, for example, enter into a contract to buy a car or buy a house. And, and this is very pertinent, of course, for the British, you can't make a contract with anybody that's with a citizen of a state with which your country is at war. <laughs> now, the British are probably the most aggressive nation on the planet. We've had wars with everybody had two wars with Nepal, had wars with countries which are thousands and thousands of miles away from our own country. So you can't make a contract with the citizen of a state with which your country is at war. So in the Falklands dispute, known as hostilities, and as in South America they call it the Malvinas, although people were killed in battles and ships were sunk, it was never a war. It never reached that level. It was always described as hostilities. Because if the British government had said it's a war, then all the British companies that had contracts with Argentinian companies would have had all the contracts cancelled. And we didn't want that. So it was never a war, despite the 2,000 deaths. It was just hostilities. And lastly, well, there must be the intention to create a contract. And by that, we mean the parties must know and understand what they're agreeing to and understand that the contract can be enforced through the courts. Now, the most important feature of a contract is that an offer. 
you can make it to the world at large or you can make it to just one person and when that person agrees or accepts that is called a meeting of minds the latin phrase is consensus ad idem meeting of minds it's a stupid expression because how can anybody know if my mind has met your mind what it means really is that the parties must know and understand what they're agreeing to. And how will we check this? Well, it, it's fairly simple. We will look at your behavior. If you behave as if you've entered into a contract, you'll be treated as if you have entered into a contract, regardless of what you were thinking or regardless of what your intentions were. So this phrase is also known as concurrence of wills. The main thing is really to understand what it really means is both parties must know and understand what they're agreeing to the moment they do that's when the contract comes into being that moment when there is consensus ad idem now the offer can be to the one person or to the whole world i could put an offer on a lamppost 100 dollars reward for anybody that finds my lost dog you don't have to knock on my door and then say, Richard, I've seen your advert and I'm going to look for your dog. You accept the offer by your behavior. You go out and look for it. And if you find it, then I have to pay you because you accepted my contract with your behavior. The best case that illustrates this in the common law system is the old case of Carlyle and the Carbolic Smokeball Company. And although I don't normally spend too much time explaining cases, I will on this one because it's such a lovely Victorian story. Unfortunately, in 1890 or so, there was a dreadful pandemic in the UK. 250,000 people died from flu. Well, the Carbolic Smokeball Company set itself up and started advertising a patent medicine in newspapers and in adverts in chemists' shop windows. It was the Carbolic Smokeball. It produced a small rubber ball with a hollowed out center. Into the center, you are meant to pour a very weak form of acid known as carbolic acid. It's very weak acid. It's used in soap even. My grandmother used to use it. She was born in the Victorian times. It has a dreadful smell. Having poured the acid into the ball, you then put a tube into the center of the ball. The other end of the tube was split into two parts. You stuck both of the parts up your nose and you inhaled the fumes three times a day. Sounds disgusting. Mrs. Carlyle, the wife of a, an English lawyer, bought one of these balls. She used it in the appropriate manner for three weeks, three times a day, sorry, for six weeks, three times a day. And then you can guess what happened. She caught the flu. So she applied to the Carbolic Smokeball Company for the reward which they offered to anybody that contracted flu after using their smokeball. And the Carbolic Smokeball Company dithered and wouldn't pay. So her husband sued them on her behalf. Uh, the Smokeball Company said, well, this isn't breach of contract because we've never met this woman, therefore there's no contract. And the court said, no, you don't have to meet her. You made an offer to the world at large. And they said, well, she didn't accept the contract because we had no notice of acceptance. And again, the court said, she didn't have to notify you of acceptance. She accepted it through her behavior. As a result of which, the Carbolic Smoke War Company lost the case. Out of interest, by the way, the reward was £100. In 1892, you could buy a house for that. The court, however, on a technicality, refused to award the money to Mrs. Carlyle, saying in a more polite manner than I'm going to say it now, that it uh, was mere advertising puff and any reasonable person would not have, would have understood it wasn't really the truth. What they really meant was any stupid people would have accepted this advertising and thought they'd actually get £100 if they caught the flu. But they were much more polite than I am. And then we come to acceptance. Somebody must accept the offer, but the acceptance must be unconditional, not an attempt to renegotiate. 
So be very careful, all of those of you who negotiate. Every time you put in a different offer, it's what's called a counter offer. I offer to sell you my car for £10,000, and you say, I'll give you 9500 That's a counter offer, and it kills off the original offer. I could just cross my hands and say, oh, right, I'm not selling to you then. You can't go back and say, all right, we'll pay 10000 It's too late. You've killed off my offer with your counter offer. And, and, and the, the excellent case in this, I haven't really got time to go through it today, is Hyde and Wrench, where Mr. Wrench basically got so annoyed with Mr. Hyde offering him a reduced amount to purchase Mr. Wrench's farm, that in the end he just said, I'm not selling to you, even though Mr. Hyde went back and said, I accept the first price you asked me for. Now, the next thing is consensus ad idem. There must be a meeting of minds. The parties must know and understand what they're agreeing to. And the best case here is another old English case from 1871, where Mr. Smith went to sell fresh green oats to be fed to the racehorses trained by Mr. Hughes. Hughes looked at the sample, held them in his hand, and said of these fresh green oats, yes, these are the quality I want. Mr. Smith and Mr. Hughes then negotiated the price, the quantity, and the delivery dates, and shook hands. So Mr. Smith went off thinking he'd got a big order and a big contract. When he delivered the first delivery of about 20 sacks of fresh green oats a few weeks later, Mr. Hughes said, these are fresh green oats. These oats are for racehorses. Racehorses' stomachs are so delicate that they can only eat aged oats. They can't eat new oats. You must have known I was thinking that. Mr. Smith said, I knew nothing of the sort. And Mr. Smith sued Mr. Hughes for the contract price. This case went right up to the uh, senior court in the UK at the time. And the judges came to a test. They said, we cannot know whether one man's mind has met another, but a party, a person, will be judged according to their behaviour. If you act as if you have entered into a contract, then you'll be treated as having entered into the contract, regardless of what you were thinking. And the test will be not what the judges think, but what a reasonable member of the public would think if they saw what was going on and heard what was said. And they came to the conclusion, in the case of Mr. Smith and Mr. Hughes, anybody hearing the conversation would think that Mr. Hughes has entered into the contract. Now, if I offer to sell you something and you ask for uh, some more information, that's not a counteroffer. That's merely a request for more information. I offer to sell you my car and you say, how many thousands of kilometers has it traveled? That's not a counteroffer. It's just a request for greater explanation. It doesn't kill off the original offer. And here's an old case from Jamaica, Harvey and Facey in 1893. As you know, in the common law, Common law jurisdictions are sometimes persuaded by the judgments of common law judges in other countries. In Harvey and Facey, it's Jamaica. So the senior court for the Jamaican judicial system is still the Privy Council Court in the UK as it's part of the Commonwealth. So this case went started in Jamaica then eventually ended up in London at the Privy Council back in 1893. What was happening here was Harvey was asking Facey, how much would you sell the land for? Facey told him, and Harvey said, I accept. At which point Facey said, yeah, but I didn't offer it. He just asked me what the price was, so I told you. There was no offer. Next, consideration. Well, it's got to have a commercial value. You often find companies which are in dreadful financial trouble put themselves up for sale for $1 on condition that the person buying the company pays off all the outstanding salaries and wages to the workforce. The buyer buys the company for $1, then 
satisfies all the debts and then starts trading and within a few years the company is worth millions. They got that company, now worth millions, for payment of one dollar. Consideration must have a value, but it doesn't have to be equal to the value of what you're buying. As I said before, one dollar, one euro, one pound, one ruble, they all have an economic value. Now, capacity. As I mentioned before, children can't enter into contracts. Mental patients can't. Serving prisoners and bankrupts can't. Enemy aliens, people with whom your country is at war, if you're a common law country, can't enter into contract with them. Or if your country's at war with them and it's a common law country, you can't enter into contracts with them because it won't be accepted in their country. Now, there must be a clear intention, the fifth element, intention to create a contract. It must be an intention to create a contract, not a loose social arrangement, not some vague arrangement to work towards a gradual expansion of the area of business, expand the market, nor can it be a loose social arrangement. I'll meet you tonight outside the cinema at nine o'clock. It's not a contract. If I don't turn up, that's very bad of me, but I haven't broken the contract. And lastly, you want to make certain that once you've negotiated all the terms, the other party doesn't turn around and say, ah, oh, right, we've got a contract. So you can prevent it from coming into contract, coming into being a contract until you want it to, by cloaking the agreement with some sort of words which say this contract is not to be a contract until we agree it is. And two cases here, Masters and Cameron is an old case from Australia, where Mrs. Cameron was going to sell her farm in the 1950s, signed a contract with Masters, where they paid a $20,000 deposit, but then she wrote at the bottom of the contract, this contract is not to be binding until it is approved by my solicitor. And the court said she clearly has withheld her intention to create a contract. There's no contract yet, even though you've written it down and called it a contract and signed it. And exactly the same in 1923 in the case of Rose and Frank Company and Crompton. Crompton sold a kind of paper which was used in business stationery in those days called carbon paper. Is American suppliers came over to discuss next year's requirements. They agreed the amount, the price, the delivery dates. They wrote it down in a contract. They signed the contract and they both wrote at the bottom, this is not to be considered a binding contract nor enforceable by the courts of the US or the UK until it is approved by our lawyers. They had clearly withheld their intention to create a contract. Now, because you have to intend to create a contract, fraud, which is a criminal act, making a misstatement of the truth, intending that somebody suffer a financial loss or that you make a financial gain. Mistake, and here we mean mutual mistake, a serious mistake about a fundamental aspect of the contract made by both parties. For example, I offer to sell you my racehorse for $1,000 and you agree, but unbeknown to both of us, the horse died yesterday. We're both mistaken as to a fundamental aspect of the contract. We both think we're dealing with a live racehorse. Misrepresentation is an innocent misstatement of the facts. I tell you that this watch which I'm selling you is solid gold because the nice man in the market in uh, Singapore told me it was gold. He tricked me. Now I'm passing it on to you, but I genuinely believe it's gold. It's not gold, but that's an innocent misrepresentation. Duress means unfair pressure. It can be anything. It could be threats of violence. It could be violence. It could be just constant pressure from a relative. It could be a totally unfair business negotiating position, whereby the person with the sole rights to import pepper, for example, into your country, tells you as the owner of a restaurant that he'll sell you two kilos of pepper, but only on condition that you buy 10 kilos of rice. That's unfair 
pressure, unfair marketing position. So fraud, mistake, misrepresentation, duress, they can all invalidate a contract even though it was entered into properly. They're defenses. If you break a contract, you can say, I broke the contract because there was a mutual mistake or there was a misrepresentation by the other party or the other party forced me to enter into the contract. Well, that's all I wanted to say really about creation of a contract. Obviously, our contract law course lasts about 15 hours and goes into contract in much greater detail. I haven't really got time to do that in this course, but I wanted to cover those five essential elements of a contract because it will become pertinent later in relation to contract drafting and other legal things we look at in the course. Now, let's have a look at some grammar. What's the most difficult thing that you come across in legal English grammar? I'll bet it's using legal prepositions. Because legal prepositions are totally different to prepositions in ordinary conversational English. And as prepositions have no particular logic to them, legal prepositions become even more difficult to deal with. The only way to learn them is through constant practice. So we're going to have some practice today. They are words which show the relationship between a noun or pronoun and they show the place, position, time or method. We use them all the time in ordinary English, like to, in, from, between, after, before, etc. Now, they usually become before the pronoun and they usually give information about how, when or where something has happened. For example, she arrived before lunch or I travelled to London. I anticipate many of you are able to use these prepositions perfectly well in your ordinary conversational English. But the problem with legal English is that the prepositions which are used in formal legal documents are difficult to master. And because there are no rules, the only way to learn them is through constant practice. So to understand prepositions, and we're gonna have a little exercise in a minute because that makes it a bit less boring than me lecturing at you. First, let's look at the general grammar rule from conversational English. The preposition should be followed by an object pronoun, like me, him, or us, rather than a subject pronoun, such as I, she, we. That's why it's correct to say, this matter is between you and me, and it's not correct to say, this matter is between you and I. They both sound okay, but you and me technically is correct. The main problem for the non-native speaker of English is remembering which preposition to use in legal writing. Here are some examples which you're going to find. These are the most common examples you're going to come across, about 12 of them. The parties to this agreement. The goods must be delivered to the purchaser. The commencement of this agreement. The price list set out in Schedule 1. Royalties were paid in accordance with. In accordance with. For a period of five years. The goods must be delivered within 14 days. The, the company agrees to provide training for service personnel. The agreement may be terminated by notice. An arrangement or a contract between the seller and the buyer. It is agreed will be collected from the seller's warehouse. Now notice this because I'm giving a specific number of the house from the seller's warehouse at 21 Redwoods Road. Well, as notice is this, the goods will be collected from the seller's warehouse in or on Redwoods Road, where there's no number. Interest will be charged on any unpaid installments after the expiration of a period of 28 days from the date hereof. Too many prepositions in that sentence, and we're going to look at that in a later lesson. He was charged with murder. Why not for murder? Why not by murder? Why with? No logic to it. The property at Two Pond Road is sold with vacant possession. Right. Now, it's very important that you get these correct because there's a huge difference, for example, although the words are very slightly different, there's a huge legal difference caused by using different prepositions. For example, the goods must be delivered 
within seven days means between now and seven days from now. Whereas the goods must be delivered in seven days means it must be delivered on the seventh day and only the seventh day. Now, tiny differences like that can cause a dispute in a contract and you can end up in litigation purely because you use the wrong preposition. So let's have a little exercise, okay? This is to do with the formation and capitalization of companies. Capitalization means raising money to go into business. So raising money for a company to take to go into business. It's usually through selling shares, isn't it? Right, so what we've got here is at, by, for, in, into, of, used twice, on, through, to, under, and without, which is this one. One. Initially, company capitalization takes place how? The issuance of shares. Notice that strange use of the verb to issue. Issuance. When we're issuing shares, we don't issue shares. It's an issuance. It's the noun for the process. Let's have a look at your answers. Here. Well done, Amma. Well done. Through. Through the issuance of shares. There. Now, a company may authorize capital in excess what? The mandatory minimum share capital. In excess what? Oh, great. Lots of answers. I really like it when you... Now, look, if you could do this stuff without my help, as I've said before, I wouldn't have a job. So, you know, don't worry about making mistakes, but you'll make it much more interesting if you try and answer these exercises. And it's good practice as well. Let's have a look. Let's see who's got it right, OK? Oh, oh and everybody's got it right. Sarah, Daniel, excellent. Excellent. Apple Zhang, excellent. Excess of the mandatory minimum share capital, but refrain from issuing all what it. All what. What shall it be after the word all? Good. Lots of answers coming in. Excellent. This exercise, by the way, is taken from our legal writing course. The recorded version of the course is 60 lessons filled with topics like this. There's no rocket science in it, just 60 points to tighten up your legal writing. Uh, I'm very proud of it. Well done, Apple Jane. Of. Yeah, ThinkPad. Of. Great. Well done, Pakistan. Okay, well done. Uh, what else are you? Daniel. Of. Excellent. Okay, good. Issuing all of it until later date or talk. Now, as you know, limited liability in a company refers to the fact that the liability for the debts of the company by those who own the company, the shareholders and the directors is limited to the amount of money they paid for their shares or the amount of money they have paid into the company. So we call that limited liability. It's a privilege. So in return, what? The privilege of limited liability, something law, shareholders' powers are generally restricted. And that's how we're doing. Ah, you're all doing great. Well done, Guyisa, Munir. Well done. In return for the privilege of limited liability, my mistake there. See how everybody makes a mistake? Should see the privilege of limited liability. Now, what? Privilege of liability, something law. What do you think that is? Under, under law. Well done, Al Hanouf. Well done. Well done, Monia. Well done, Samir. Yeah, Shaza. Very good. In return for the privilege of limited liability, under law, we're all under the law, aren't we? So it's under law. Now, one last one. Someone with ownership rights something, a company. We're talking here about a shareholder. Shareholders own the company because each share is a share of the company. Someone with ownership writes something, a company can express their disappointment, something, the company's performance. So what's the first one? Ownership rights at, by, of, in, through, to, under. What do you think it is? Let's have a look. Well done, Yelena. In, Francesca. In, great. Oh, Yelena, yeah, great. In, anybody else. Vincent, in, excellent. 
Okay. Some of the ownership rights in a company can express their disappointment. What we're saying is we're not happy with the company's performance. So express their disappointment. What? Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> not yet. As, <laughs> who, who hasn't answered a question yet? Because nobody's got it right yet. Express their disappointment. What? Let's see who's got this. Ah, Guyi San. Ah, your teacher's pet, Guyi San. And Kiara. Excellent. Disappointment at. Express their disappointment. Some of the ownership rights in a company can express their disappointment at the company's performance. Um, you, you might say, with a human being, you're disappointed by their behavior. But with, a not, with an inanimate object, you're often disappointed at. Their disappointment at the company's performance. Okay, let's move on. Now, I want to look at some more legal collocations. Collocation is an English teacher's word. What it really refers to is two or more words being used together and that the meaning of the phrase created is different from the meaning of the two words when the words are used individually, like fast food. We know what fast food is, hamburgers, Kentucky Fried Chicken, etc. We know what fast means, it means being quick, and we know what food is. Fast food, though, has a different meaning, motor racing. We know what motors are, we know what racing are, but when we use them together, motor racing has a special meaning. Well, there are lots of legal collocations. Well, in many cases, they consist of a verb followed by a noun. I'm going to look at just four of them. There are thousands, hundreds certainly, probably thousands. There's too many for me to cover in this short little extract. In our legal English course, we've got four separate lessons on this topic because there's so many of these. Let's have a look at just four legal collocations which are frequently used, and these are frequently used in relation to companies and company law. Let's just limit ourselves to that topic for these four for today. Now, exercise. Now, exercise normally, well, that's what we're not doing probably. Well, we're all stuck at home. We're not exercising. To exercise usually means running about, jumping, swimming, things like this. But exercise also means in the law to make use and or to apply something, to make use of. So we exercise control, we exercise rights, we exercise authority, we exercise force, meaning to apply force, or we exercise restraint, meaning we hold ourselves back, we restrain ourselves, we don't speak, we don't act, we exercise restraint. We exercise caution means we're careful, cautious. We exercise influence means we make use of the influence we have. Very nice collocations, aren't they, to use in your writing? I urge you to exercise your rights. I urge you to exercise restraint in this situation. You are, an, as the major shareholder, you can exercise influence during the shareholders' meeting. Lovely phrases. All right, let's have a look at another one a crew. Now, a crew means to gather together over time. It has this idea of gathering things together, storing them, saving them, and also the passing of time. So in particular, we think about it in gathering together money, shares, power, especially in a financial sense. We accrue, gather together over time. We accrue benefits. The company will accrue revenue from this line of sales. The bondholders will accrue interest on the money they've loaned. Politicians accrue power through votes. The shareholders will accrue power. You may accrue rights. And of course, you deposit money in a bank hoping to accrue capital, meaning the interest that gathers on the money to accrue capital. Okay, let's look at another one. Restrict, which means to limit, to hold back. 
you can restrict powers. Shareholders' powers are restricted. We will restrict the powers of the shareholders. We will restrict the powers of the government. We'll restrict the powers of the voters. We will restrict access, meaning we will not allow them to get access to it. Restrict access to land, restrict access to voting, restrict access to your bank account. We will restrict freedom, restrict freedom of the voters, restrict freedom of the shareholders to vote at the meeting, restrict freedom of the sales force to carry out this behavior, restrict freedom of our competitors. We will restrict spending because we want to save money. We'll limit our spending. We'll restrict spending by the sales team. And lastly, dismiss, which means, well, it has two meanings. First, it means to remove someone from their job, usually because they've done something wrong, like theft or punching one of the other employees. But also judges use it or courts use it, meaning we're going to stop this case. We're going to stop or cease to consider thinking about it. We're finishing it. To put out of our judicial consideration, out of our minds, we're not thinking about it, we will dismiss the case. To dismiss a case. The court found the defendant innocent and dismissed the charge against him. There's a claim brought by somebody who's been injured and the court dismissed their claim because there was no evidence. The company dismissed an employee for misbehavior. The club will dismiss members for misbehavior. You are members of a company through the ownership of a share. If the shares were cancelled, of course, you'd be dismissed as a member of the company. Right, so you got those four, right? So let's have a little exercise. We're going to use just these four. Let's go through these questions together one at a time like before. We're going to look at exercise, accrue, restrict and dismiss. A motion was filed by the lawyers to what the case? Don't anybody write cancel, please. Okay. Good. This is pretty simple. There's only one in four answers, so everybody can have a go. Let's wait till we get to 20 answers before I look at them. 18. Anyone, any more offers? As we say in England, any more for any more? 19. One more answer, anyone? You got a 25% chance of being successful. Why not just? All right. Ah, oh, 20. There we go. Let's have a look what we got. 21. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Adriano. Dismiss, dismiss. Vincent, <laughs> Ahmed, dismiss. Slavic, dismiss. Everybody's got it, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Very good, everyone. All right. Next one. The chairman warned that if shareholders did not receive a dividend, meaning a payment from the company for owning the shares out of the company's profits, they might what their rights to sell their shares. Okay, let's see what we've got. Oh, exercise, yes. Exercise, Victor. Yeah, yeah. Exercise, Sarah. Very good. Exercise. The chairman warned that if shares, shareholders did not receive a dividend, they might exercise their rights. Exercise your right to vote. Exercise your right to demand your money back. Exercise your right. Good. Next. Chief executive resigned when the board tried to something control over the expansion plan. So the chief executive is the CEO. And he was very unhappy because the board obviously outvoted him in some way. Let's see what happened. Mm. Well, yes and no. Exercise, not restrict. Let's go back to restrict. You've all put restrict, I understand. It would have to say the chief executive resigned when the board tried to restrict his control over the expansion plan. If it, the word his had been here, restrict would be correct. But because it's not there, it, it can't use restrict. It doesn't fit grammatically. What does fit grammatically is exercise. The board tried to exercise control. The chief executive resigned when the board tried to exercise control over the expansion plan. Now, I have to say this, everybody makes mistakes. You've seen a mistake by me already in this presentation. Everybody makes mistakes. 
you'll tighten your right, writing up. You'll become more competent, more professional in your writing if you check what you've written. I know we're rushing to complete these exercises. I do understand that. Probably most of you, if you'd taken time to reread what you'd written, if you'd written that sentence, you would have seen that restrict didn't fit and you'd have changed it to exercise. But it's very important in legal writing, in legal English, take your time and get it right rather than rush and make a mistake. You'll be judged professionally by your other lawyers very unfairly on your English grammar. It's really got nothing to do with it's really got nothing to do with your legal knowledge. You may be the best lawyer in your city, but if you can't write grammar, correct English grammar, other lawyers will think, will assume that that reflects your general professional competence. It's not fair, it's not logical, but it's what happens. That's why legal writing is such an important topic for all lawyers to, to learn. Now then, what are we going to do here? We're going to something spending while our sales remain weak. <laughs> What's it going to be, everybody? Okay. Well, it's restrict. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Marina, Jakub, Sarah. It's restrict. We will restrict spending while our sales remain weak. It means to limit, remember? Okay. Let's have a look at another. Benefits what? to the owners and operators of the factories, as well to the shareholders. What's the word? Good, let's see what we've got. Accrue, accrued, yeah, accrue, accrue. Watch your spelling, everyone, but that's great. Accrue, accrue, everybody's got it, excellent, accrue. Benefits accrue to the owners and operators of the factories, as well as to the shareholders. Yeah, benefits gathered over time to the owners. Is there one more? I think there is. Let me have a look. Ah, oh, yes. The auditors, these are the accountants called in by the company to check their records, check their financial records before they're presented in a report to the shareholders at the annual general meeting. The auditors advise shareholders to something caution in their share dealings until further investigations. Something's wrong, obviously. The auditors owe their duty not to the company, but to the shareholders when they produce their report. So the auditors advise the shareholders to do this with caution. I mean, be careful, in other words, in their share dealings until further investigations. Let's see how we're doing. Exercise, everybody. Al Hanouf, Marina, Munir, Catherine, great, Slavic, Samia, Guyisan, Daniel. Great stuff. Well done, everyone. Uh, there might be one more. That might be the end. Let me have a look. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What's this one then? An important new law may something the freedom of directors to increase their salaries without shareholder approval. Okay, let's have a look at what we've got. Restrict. Excellent. Everybody's got it right. Well done, everyone. To restrict the freedom of directors to increase their salaries without shareholder approval. Oh, that's great. Is that the end? Oh, I think oh, this is the very last one then. Right? The annual general meeting has authority. That's the annual general meeting of shareholders, the AGM. Every company must have an annual general meeting once a year. The AGM has authority to draw up or amend the constitution and power to elect or what the directors of the board. What was the opposite of elect? It is to elect means to put somebody in a position. Dismiss. Oh, this is too easy for you guys. Great. Well done. Now, how did you do? Now, if you give yourself four, correct, then give yourself, or more, give yourself what we call a pat on the back. Idiomatic English. We've only just gone through this list and you've had very little time for them to sink in. So well done. Now, you'll note from the last typical sentence, let's have a look at it. Had power to elect or dismiss directors of the board, right? It's very idiomatic, isn't it? And that last phrase, give yourself a pat on the back, meaning congratulate yourself. It's very idiomatic English. It's both idiomatic and complex. And both ordinary English and legal English. 
is idiomatic and complex. Sink in. These are two idioms. Plus, as you know, let's have a look at this sentence, okay? If you got four or more correct, then give yourselves a pat on the back, i.e., well done. Right, that's very idiomatic, and we've even got Latin in i.e. stands for idest, which means that is. Sink in. What does that mean? To sink in. Lots of idioms and one Latin in one short, simple sentence. But you're advancing your knowledge, even if these lessons are stretching you slightly. Now, to anyone who got all the answers correct, very well done indeed. Most non-lawyer native English speakers would not have been able to achieve your score. Like so many other pieces of legal English, including phrasal verbs and idioms, there are no rules relating to the way in which collocations work. The only way to learn them is through constant repetition of practice. I advise you, really, to watch this lesson several times. So the collocations sink into your memory, and I say it again, practice, practice, practice. Everything you've seen today has taken from excerpts from our lessons on legal writing, contract law, and legal English. They're just parts of the lessons rather than full lessons, but I've gathered them together. Practice makes perfect, Daniel. Very good. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. Yeah. The one thing I will encourage you to do, I know you're in lockdown, I know you're stuck at home. Practice your English during this period. Okay, we've got, got these free lessons. We have lots of other lessons. Don't forget on our website, let's go to our website for a moment, okay? And we'll bring it up now as soon as this opens. Okay, let's go to online courses. Here, here's a free little course Legal English Vocabulary. There you are, you just go to the online courses and click Legal English. It's not, it's just 10 short little lessons. It may be about 150 words, but it's useful. There's quite a bit of Latin in there for those of you who are not familiar with it. There are all these other courses, of course, which are paid courses. Some are very technical, like company and corporate law, or oil and gas law. We're going to start a lot of these new ones around the beginning of May. But for the moment, while we're all in lockdown, Take advantage of these three things on our website, including the free tests and the Legal English Vocabulary course. All right, everyone, that's enough for me for today. Let's bring this back into the main screen. Let's stop the screen sharing. Thank you, everyone, for being so active today. It's a pleasure to teach when everybody's active. When you sit there not doing anything, it's boring for me. I'd like it if you join LinkedIn and join our British Legal Centre group on LinkedIn or connect with me on LinkedIn. But for the time being, thank you very much, everyone, for today. Pleasure seeing you again. I look forward to seeing everybody at the next lesson next week. Bye bye for today, everyone. Let me try and unmute some of you in case you have any questions. Guyi san, thank you so much for joining us, Guyi san. Thank you, Kiara. Thank you for being so active today. Thank you, Mark Mood. Anything about, ah, oh, the book. Thank you very much. Yeah, Shaz has asked me about a book which I mentioned. We're trying to find a way to upload this book onto our site so we can give you a link direct to it. What I think I will do is this. I'll make it a condition that you join the British Legal Center Group on LinkedIn, and I'll put a link of some kind to allow you to download the book or to contact us in some way to get the book downloaded. This is a book on how to, well, how to manage the first few years of your legal career from finishing at university to getting work experience, getting an interview, performing at the interview, getting a job, your first year or two in the job to get yourself noticed, to get rapid promotions. It's so all the things I wish I had known when I first qualified. I wish there was a book like this around when I qualified. It's only about 80 pages long. I'll try and make it available sometime over the next week or so. I'll um, probably post details on the website or I'll tell everybody at the next lesson how they can get a copy. Okay, we'll finish there. Goodbye for today, everyone. See you again soon.